O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from his grave? I am worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed. They will turn back in sudden disgrace. Amen. Guide our thinking, O Lord, by deepening our understanding of your word. Now read in our presence. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to get a tradesman? Hmm? Do you? Or do you just pick up the phone and one arrives within the next, I don't know, quarter of an hour? Well, if I was to tell you of a place not far from here where you would never have struggled to get a tradesman, you could have had anything you wanted made in gold or in silver or in wood. If you, if you wanted those joists fixed in a building, it would have happened instantly. You could have walked into the main street of this place and seen monarchs. And also, I don't know if you'd want to, but you could see senior leaders of the church. You would have heard French, I suspect, as frequently as English or Scots. And I imagine because of those things, the bread might have been quite good as well. You're wondering where this place is. Any takers where I'm talking about? It's Whithorn. Whithorn. Probably after the cathedral in Glasgow, the most important place for the church in Scotland. And it was buzzing. Why? Well, because of the, the journey known as pilgrimage that people were encouraged to make. They were told, <coughs> go to a place. Go to a place that's important to us. You might get closer to God. <coughs> well, that's, that's true. You might, but you might not. Because the real journey is not where you go with your feet. This is a problem with pilgrimage, I have to say. The problem with it is we always get more fascinated, even when we try not to. We become more fascinated about where we're going with our feet instead of where we're going in our hearts. So the biggest journey, the most important journey, is not where the feet fall, but it's where the heart goes. Sadly, maybe excessively, but you've got to understand where they come from, at the Reformation in Scotland, our friends with the long beards, I mean, makes mine look like just some fluff that could blow in the wind. Our friends with the long beards banned it because they were so scared that people would become only interested in where the foot goes and not where the heart goes. They said, we are making in the Church of Scotland pilgrimage illegal. And I don't know if any General Assembly's ever overturned that rule. Though we talk about pilgrimage now and even in Whithorn, people are starting to say, could there be a value in people coming here? I don't know if the assembly's ever said, you know, we banned this, and we've never overturned the ban. There's something to do on a Tuesday afternoon if you're at the General Assembly and you're bored of the reports. Why don't you put forward a motion like that and get it seconded and see where it goes? So I want to talk this morning then about the real journey from sighing to singing. And the great thing about this is we don't need to actually go anywhere with our feet. We, we can ponder this journey right here 
with you and me, our hearts, and an almighty God. And I'll speak first about the journey's origin, where you could start, where some people maybe are even now. Then we'll say a word on the journey's end. And then the third point will be, well, how do you go between the two? So let's take the first point, the journey's start. If you've got the Bible, take a look at verse uh, 1 to 3 and 6 to 7. And I'm going to tell you right now, you've only had three relationships in your life. Okay? You might think you've had plenty, but you've only had three. And um, these three could be in, in good working order. These three could be not in good working order. It's only possible to have three. That's, that's your maximum. And David in Psalm 6, he has all three, like us. But I hope unlike us, not one of them's going well. <laughs> so it, it's tough if one of these relationships is not going well and the other two are. It's very, very tough if all three are not going well at the exact same time. I'll read the verses and I'll tell you where they are. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful, for I am faint. Well, he feels judged by God, abandoned by God. Whether he is being judged or abandoned is not the issue. He feels like he is. So you could say his first relationship is him and God. And at this moment in time, David doesn't feel that's a very good relationship. It's in tatters. Verse 3, my soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? I'm worn out from my groaning all night long. I flood my bed with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. Maybe some of you have cried yourself to sleep at night. You, if you're anything like me, are the one who speaks to you the most. I'll say that again. You speak to you the most. If you're ever wondering, you know, who have I conversed with most in my life? Myself. I mean, I don't mean I have these great big wandering, meandering conversations with myself, but have you ever stood in a shop and you see the price of something and you go, is that the price of that? And you go back and you, you take a look at it, is that the price? And then you're checking, have I got my wallet here? Will Apple Pay work here? And you're conversing with yourself. Now, maybe not out loud, obviously, as the other shoppers walk by, but you know what I mean when I say you, you reflect on things in yourself. You med that's meditating. You meditate things through. Should I do this? Or maybe in the moments of regret, as you ponder, why did I say that? Was I right to say that? So... Crying yourself to sleep. Some of you have done it for maybe different reasons, but you know what it is. The weight of something in your life, and it's the last thing you think about before you enter unconsciousness, and it's the first thing that comes into your head the minute you wake back up again. That's what David had there. I cry myself to sleep. So there you go. The second relationship with himself not very good. Now, what's the third relationship? Well, unless you're living on a desert island, the third relationship is everybody else that comes across your path. We might call it the other, other people. And some come in the guise of parents or siblings or friends or spouses. And with every one of them, you can relate to them in that childhood phrase. If you ever played at games, and I hope the young folks still do actually do physical games outside and not everything's on an Xbox, but we would play a game and when someone would come into the base, we would say, halt, friend, or foe. And every person we meet, that's the relationship, choices. Either this is a friend or it's a foe. Well, how is David? with regards to the other people in his life. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. So he's surrounded by others that really don't want what's right for him, he feels. He doesn't get on with himself. 
and he doesn't feel he's getting on with God. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't have a very good estimation of themselves. You've got one out of the three. Maybe there's someone else sitting here this morning who thinks, I don't really feel God moves much in my life at all. How long, O Lord? How long? Or maybe there's someone else that thinks, I could give you on a piece of paper half a dozen names right now of people who would love to see me fall. I mean, they would love it. They would be on Facebook and Instagram and every social media rejoicing at my falling. If you had one of those, like David, I would say you start the journey today in a tough place. If you've got two or three, you might think, oh, right, no one now, no one will be able to know what it's like to be me. Well, before we move on, let's just think about that last point. If it is the case, there's anybody here who has all three relationships pretty crummy, and you think, well, am I like David? I, I don't even know if David was being judged by God. I'm saying he feels like he was. But I can tell you of one person who was. I can tell you of one person who could say, how long, O Lord, why have you forsaken me? Because he was forsaken from the Father. And I can tell you about a person who, while hanging on a cross, his enemies were standing, laughing at him. And I can tell you of that same person who almost wept himself to sleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, if you are in a dark, dark place in life because of illness or bereavement or divorce or just life, you know, just life, just because you've watched too much television and you see the reality of our world where we're happier to extend fists to one another than an open hand in generosity, and that's got you down, then the thing you remember from this psalm is this. Jesus has been there before me, and he knows exactly what it's like, not just to feel judged, but to be judged. Let's move to the second point, and then we'll tie it up on the third one quickly. The place we go to, or journeys end, 8 to 10. Away from me, all you who do evil, the Lord has heard my weeping, the Lord has heard my cry for mercy. He's heard. Not a big long prayer, crying before God is as valid a prayer as any erudite language. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed, they will turn back in sudden disgrace. Did he see that in his life? Did he see every enemy corrected in his life? Did David see that? No, he did not see that. And I suspect neither will I and neither will you. You know, there's always going to be people in your life who don't want what's right for you. But the Lord wants what's right for you. So just have him in your life. Because when the journey ends, and David is looking forward here to that word that we said the other month, judgment, or another word you could use, vindication. That's very positive. That's the moment in his life when he sees all the wrongs made right. And that's the moment he enters glory. And that's the moment, unlike poor Jean from Montreal, who was welcomed by 200 and odd people. He's welcomed by the host of heaven. And that's where our journey comes to its conclusion. So though it might start in a very dark, difficult place, it ends in a fantastic place. That's where our Christian loved ones are right now, in that fantastic place. So the question, as I tie it up, how do you get from the sighing to the singing. I mean, how do I move from feeling this break in all three relationships, God, myself, other people, to this place where I know a day is coming which will be immeasurably wonderful? How do I, how do I get to that? And the way 
John Calvin said, large doors can swing on small hinges. This psalm has a hinge, and it's verse 4. Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Now, I'm going to try and practically help you so that you can move in your life from sighing to singing. And I'm going to ban not physical pilgrimage this morning, but I'm going to ban a certain type of praying. And I think it's a prayer that you've maybe prayed. Look, I'll be honest, I've prayed it. But I'm trying to ban it, and I have to keep banning it time after time because it comes back, this prayer. It comes back. And David is saying in verse 4, you just ban this prayer. Don't pray it. It pops into your head. Just say, out my head. Here it is. You're in a tight spot, okay? Maybe you've been in a tight spot before. You've exhausted your avenues of hope. You know, that way you've, you've tried friends, you've tried family. You're in a tight spot. Here comes the prayer. Lord, if you then I will. And you can pad that prayer out. Lord, if you do this for me here, then I will promise I will do this for you there. And thus we enter into the great transaction. And what you're basically saying is, in that prayer, when you think about it, there's something in me. I'm making a promise, so that's good. There's something in me. And because of that, would you not get me out of this spot? Would you not have a, a better relationship with me or that I could have a better relationship with myself or with my, with my foes? And you see, David prays a prayer that says, God answers not because David is good, but because God is. You hold God to his promises in your prayers and your prayers are answered. Don't try and hold God to your whims. Ban your whims. Hold on to his promises. The person who prays in light of biblical promises has answers to prayer. Now, not always yes. <laughs> no is an answer, which is valid. Many parents, I think, will back me up on that. No is a valid answer when someone is asking. And so is not yet. Not yet is a valid answer. When mums and dads say to you, um, not yet. It doesn't mean not ever. It just means not yet. And those are the three answers that God gives us. Yes, no, and not yet. If we pray in light of his promises that he is good, it's not a goodness in us, and we ban that terrible type of praying, Lord, I will do this if you then do that, or you reverse it. If you do this, I will do that. The most difficult place we begin can still be the place we can leave to arrive at the best place of all. And at the end of the message, let it be said, you are going to a place more vibrant, more exciting, and more God-filled than Whithorn. Thank you.